we'd like to take a moment to thank our listeners sincerely for your support of Honest News Network Ministry. If you're interested in supporting this ministry, please use the information provided. Thank you. in my throat today, so <clears throat> voice is a little off. I apologize for that, but it really is out of my hands at this point. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, God, we appreciate everything, Lord, you do for us. You are so faithful to us, Lord. We realize, Lord, without you, we would be lost. We realize, Lord, that without you sending your Son, that we would be lost forever. We thank you so much, Lord, for eternal life through your Son. We thank you for the life that he gave to us, his life your life, Lord, that we might have that life more abundantly. We pray, Lord, that you will bless and anoint this message as we minister your word, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. 
And we're continuing our <clears throat> series, The Power of Intercession. Let me get a drink of water here. So <clears throat> now we're going to be looking at the life of Job and his intercession. How many know that Job wasn't always willing <clears throat> to pray for his friends, those that didn't understand what Job was going through? It's amazing when folks don't understand what you're going through that because they care so much, they tend to try too much. Huh? They, tr they tend to get in the way, even. Uh, Job's friends, were they were his friends, there's no question about it, but they didn't understand what he was going through. And so <clears throat> in trying too hard, to understand what he was going through and hurting for him, they got in the flesh and they allowed the devil to use them. And they became his accusers, right? Just remember, flesh and blood is not our enemy. Amen. Job. Job had to learn this. Not only did he have to learn that his friends, when they were accusing him, that they were not not his enemy, but he had to learn that there was an enemy, right? He had to learn that there was a devil because he didn't know. He had to learn that. You and I, today, we have that advantage. We know there's a devil, and we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, amen? We're wrestling with principalities, wicked spirits. Amen. <clears throat> Job chapter 42 and verse 10, we're going to begin this part of our series. If you like to turn there, following the reading of God's word. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. When he prayed for his friends. Are you listening? When he prayed for his friends. Isn't that interesting? God did not turn the captivity of Job. He didn't turn it around for Job. He didn't deliver him from his trial until he prayed for his friends. <clears throat> we don't always pray for those that are our accusers, do we? And most of the time we don't. Do you realize that Job never prayed for them during this whole trial? right? You suppose that if he would have prayed for them sooner, the trial would have been quicker? Just like Israel ending up in the wilderness for 40 years, could have been 40 days. We're the ones that are prolonging our deliverance, folks, whether we understand it or not. It's our choice. It's our attitude. If we want to hang on to something, if we want to hold on to a grudge, whatever it might be, then our captivity is going to continue. And how many know Job became captive to Satan, right? He became Satan's captive. And we see in the New Testament, those that oppose themselves, it says they are taken captive by Satan at his will. Job had to be delivered from Satan, from 
his enemy. Now, you know the story that Satan desired to have Job, right? Just like he desired to have Peter. And in both instances, God did not stop Satan. Now, God was not going to allow Satan to destroy Job, but he was going to use the devil to test him. And did you know right here in this same context we're looking at right now, it actually says that God is the one that brought this evil upon Job doesn't say Satan did, it says God did. Why? He was testing him. He was proving him. He was purifying him. Job said, the thing that I feared the most came upon me. God wanted to get that out of Job. He wanted to deliver him of his fear. And he had to take him through the purification process. And Job is the one that said, when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Nothing will open the door to Satan like fear, people. Are you listening? Anything that's not of faith is sin. And you can open the door to Satan and let him in to your life through fear, through unbelief, through doubt. So the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends or when he interceded for his friends, when he uh, petitioned God, right? When he entreated God on the behalf of his friends. Now listen to me, brothers and sisters. The scripture makes it clear that God's wrath was against Job's friends. Are you listening? Let's read. It says, When he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Let's drop back a little bit here. I want you to see something. And some of these words are not easy to pronounce, so you'll have to bear with me. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Hear, I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. Now, that's, that's not God speaking to Job. That's Job speaking to God. And Job is saying to God, I demand. And that's a whole nother lesson, but how many know there's a difference between demanding something and commanding? Job is not commanding God. He's demanding. How many know that you can't have, and I think we just gave a message about this, you can't have a supply without a demand. Your supply is only as great as your demand. And Job has learned something. 
So he says to God, I demand of thee, declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Makes all the difference, just like it did for Isaiah, right? I saw the Lord high and lifted up, his train filled the temple. The angels cried, holy. Listen to me. When you see the king, it'll change your perspective about everything, including, and most importantly, about yourself. But notice here in verse 6, Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's the same thing we see where Abraham was interceding and treating God for Sodom and for Lot and his family. And Abraham said, I'm but dust and ashes. But here we see Job, that he is saying that he is but dust and ashes. There's a lot lot different here, right? Abraham's not before God saying, I'm dust and ashes and I abhor myself. But Job is in a different place than Abraham is. Job is not interceding. Are you listening? Job is not praying for his friends right now. He's not entreating God on behalf of someone else. God has to deal with Job first. He's got to get him to the place to where he will pray for his friends. How many know God is no respecter of persons? As I mentioned to you in the previous message, how that the Lord rebuked me because I was saying to God, why do you let Bill Gates live? And the Lord said to me, same reason I let you live. My grace, my grace. God's no respecter of persons, folks. But Job has got to learn. He's got to get the right estimate of himself. Wherefore, I abhor myself and I repent. See, Job is repenting before God long before he prays for his friends. Are you listening? But Abraham... He was praying for his family. He was praying for not only Lot and his family, but he was praying for at least 50 would be enough to spare all of Sodom. So he wasn't concerned with just Lot and his family. He was concerned about sparing all of Sodom. Are you listening? But he does mention that... uh, he says to God, he says, will you destroy the wicked with uh, the righteous with the wicked? So he was primarily uh, focusing on the righteous, obviously, right? Because he said, will you spare the city if there's this many righteous? So Abraham was not so much trying to get God to spare the wicked as he was trying to get him to spare the city for the righteous. And the scripture says, uh, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it began at us, where would the ungodly and the wicked appear? Right? And if God, uh, if God uh, spares uh, the righteous sparingly, right? If, if he saves them sparingly, one here and one there, where would the sinner and the ungodly appear? If God is sparing the righteous one here, one there, just sparingly. Think about that. There wasn't very many righteous in Sodom, was there? Now, Job is not interceding for anyone at this point. He's not praying for his friends. He's not even praying for his family as far as we can see. In fact, through this whole trial, Job has been thinking about himself, hadn't he? Huh? Oh, yeah. All about Job. See, God wanted to deliver Job from that self-centeredness. The thing that he feared the most did come upon him because he feared it more than he feared God. Anybody listening? 
The thing you fear the most will come upon you, friend. If you fear Satan or fear hell more than you fear God, you're going to end up in hell. You can't fear something more than God and still receive God. Listen, if you, re- if you fear God, he'll come upon you. Anybody listening? If you fear Satan, he'll come upon you. Amen. So what, who are we going to submit to? Did you know when you fear Satan, you're submitting to him? Did you know that? Oh, yeah. So God was delivering Job of his fear. And there is no fear in love, right? Perfect love casteth out fear. So God took Job through this fiery trial that some of us could never even imagine. I mean, I, I don't know. Folks, could you ever could you imagine going through what Job went through? But God knew that Job could handle it. He knew that Job would not fail. Otherwise, he wouldn't have let him go through it. Amen. He knew Job could go through this and come through as pure gold. He knew that. Otherwise, he wouldn't have went through it. If God allows you to go through something, it's because he knows you can handle it. He knows you can, you're ready to go through that. But a lot of times we don't know that, right? But a lot of times we don't realize what God has put within us to give us strength to go through the trial we're in. Amen. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, now that would make you think that the previous words was God speaking, but in these very words that we just read, verse 5, 4, 3, that's not God speaking, that's Job. But before this chapter, we see God was saying very much to Job, wasn't he? God was saying to Job, where were you? Amen? Where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Where were you when I stretched out? So there there was a whole period of time where God was speaking to Job. And now Job is uh, speaking to God. And he's saying to God, I am but dust and ashes. I abhor myself. Amen? Now Job has a correct estimate of himself. And let's just say this. He can see clearly now. Remember what Jesus said? Get the speck out of your, or the mote out of your own eye so that you can clearly see to tell your brother about the speck in his own, in his eye. Amen. And that's really what's going on here. God is trying to help Job with that mote, that log that's in his eye. Are you listening, folks? And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. See, God's wrath is going out, and Job has to is going to have to intercede. He's going to have to entreat the Lord on their behalf. The Lord knows how to put the pressure on, doesn't he? Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. Are you listening? For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz, the Temanite, and Bildad, the Shudite and or Shuhite and the and Zophar, the Nemanite, Namathite, went and did according as the Lord commanded them. 
And the Lord also accepted Job. Are you listening? He wouldn't accept them, but he's accepting Job. Just because, just because you may be a friend of a righteous person, that doesn't mean that God's going to hear you. Amen? Now, we know that God spoke to his friends, so obviously they were able to hear God's voice. They were able to understand God. Isn't that what happens in the church today? You have brothers and sisters that don't understand what another brother or sister is going through, and they're quick to judge, they're quick to condemn, they're quick to accuse, because many times they don't understand what that person's going through, and they start playing God, don't they? That's dangerous, as we see here. God's wrath was going out against them. We've got to let God be God, folks. We've got to put it in God's hands. Can you say amen? Leave it in the Lord's hands. Let the Lord be God. Let him do his job and you do yours. You do your part. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. If you go on to read, you will find that, well, let's read this. And then came there unto him all his brethren, all his sisters, and all that had been his acquaintances before. You suppose they, Eliphaz and uh, Bildad, you you suppose those that... uh, God's wrath was going to go out against those that he prayed for. You suppose they were there at this dinner? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were there. Then came there unto him all his brethren, all his sisters, and all they that had been his acquaintances before, and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him, they comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money, and everyone gave him an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she-asses. Now listen. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And you go on to read, we won't read this, but you go on to read and you'll find that God gave Job another 150 years, I believe it was, 150 years on the earth after his trial was over to enjoy his new family. Are you listening? He had a a big family. Amen. He had sons and daughters and he got to see them grow up and And so God gave, I believe it was, three to four generations. He gave him time on the earth to experience three to four generations as a very wealthy, very uh, blessed man. Why? Because he he didn't charge God foolishly when he was in the trial. Because he trusted in the Lord. Amen? Because he never gave up, he never quit. Because he overcame. Are you listening? Praise God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Jesus says, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you. Pray for them? Yeah, just like Job prayed for his friends. Amen? Intercede for them. Are you listening? Entreat God on their behalf. That's what Jesus is saying. Entreat God that his wrath won't go out against your enemies. 
that you may be the children, and that word children in the original Greek is sons, that you may be the sons of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Are you listening? You go down all the way to the last verse. Listen to what it says. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Let's take a look at this word perfect. Let's take a look at this. <clears throat> this word perfect. It means complete in moral or in mental, in moral character, completeness. This is what I like. Are you getting the message, folks? Full age. Full age. Not babes, not children. Full age. Perfect. Complete. Are you listening? Completeness. And Jesus says, and Jesus says, <clears throat> what does he say here? Be ye therefore perfect. That's exactly what God said to Abram. Be ye therefore perfect. Walk before me and be ye therefore perfect. Abram was changed to Abraham. Now Jesus is saying the same words to you and I. How come Abram was changed to Abraham, but you and I are not being changed? Well, it could be because we're not mixing faith with that word. We're supposed to be changed, transformed by the words of Jesus, folks. The same words that God said to Abram, walk before me and be ye therefore perfect. Be perfect. And Jesus likens the, or uh, connects this with intercession. And that's something. Not praying just for your friends and your family, but praying and blessing right? Blessed are, are ye when men shall rival you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. Rejoice. You want me to rejoice, Lord, when men are rival me and men are persecuting me and they're speaking all manner of evil against me falsely? You want me to rejoice? Yeah. Yeah. Be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Amen. Praise God, people. There's no way you'll be able to do that if you don't obey him. And the only way you can obey him is you've got to accept what he's saying over what you're going through. That's not how I feel, Lord. I don't feel like praying for them. I don't feel like blessing them. I don't feel like being happy right now. I don't feel like rejoicing. I don't feel like, well, it's not about a feeling. Amen? He didn't say, if you feel like it, bless them. He didn't say, if you feel like it, pray for them, intercede for them. He said, do it. Do it. Amen. Praise God. He didn't say, think about it. Amen. The Lord didn't tell you and I to 
contemplate or to figure it out in our heads or weigh it out. No, he said, rejoice. How do I rejoice? Just do it. Do it. Obviously, you're not going to be able to do it in, the, in your strength or in your flesh. So you, when you obey him, he'll give you the power. He'll give you the strength to do it. He'll give you the ability to rejoice. He's not asking you or telling you to do something you, you can't do in his power and his strength. Are you listening? He's telling you and I to do something. But he's also giving us the ability to do it. Just like when he says, be therefore perfect. Right? He gives us the ability to be perfect. Amen? He gives us the ability. He gives us the power. He gives us the grace, his strength to be perfect. Amen. Praise God. Jesus said from the good seed that there were those that would produce some 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. And those 100-fold folks are going to bring forth fruit to perfection. Amen. You're not going to get there if you don't pray for your enemies. You're not going to get there if you don't entreat the Lord for your enemies. You're not going to get there if you don't pray for your friends. You say, well, they're not my friends. Well, they will be if you pray for them. And the Lord converts them. The Lord helps them. Amen. Otherwise, God's wrath is going out against them. And you may not escape either if you won't pray for them. Because if you can't pray for somebody, you must have unforgiveness. And God says, if you don't forgive, he says, I'm not forgiving you. God's no respecter of persons, folks. He expects us to forgive every person. What does that mean? Be ready. Be ready. When someone is going to come to you and seek you, like we see Pharaoh came to Moses and Aaron and said, entreat for me. You have to be ready. Moses didn't hesitate. He did it. Amen. And those that have been against you, when they recognize they've done wrong, you got to be quick to forgive them. But let me say this to you. What if God's wrath is going out against those that have been against you? Then you got to entreat God for them. Amen. And if you have God's love in your heart, you will. Because if you truly have God's love in your heart, you don't want to see anybody end up in hell, the lake of fire. You don't want to see anybody end up under God's wrath. If you do... Your heart's not right. Your spirit's not right. You haven't fully understood God's love if you want to see someone lost forever. Amen. There's something in there God has to deal with. Amen. Just like a blockage in the arteries or a blockage for a, that causes a heart attack. Are you listening, people? There are blockages that need to be removed in our lives. It's worse than a physical heart attack. It's worse than a physical illness. It's spiritual. And there are blockages that can keep our heart from pumping properly spiritually, keeping the blood from flowing to our hearts. Are you listening? We need the blood of Jesus Christ to flow to our spiritual being. Amen. We need the blood of Jesus. We need his life. But we can block that through unforgiveness, through fear, through doubt, unbelief. Praise the Lord. Blockages kill people. My mother 
had to have three triple bypass surgery, or what was it? Yeah, three, I think. Two or three, anyway. Tri- triple bypass surgeries because of blockages in the arteries. Are you listening, people? Praise God. Let the Lord purge you, right? Let the Lord remove those blockages. Amen. Glory to God. We're going to continue this uh, series on power of intercession. Glory to God. And uh, I believe the Lord is leading us to understand about intercession, to understand what fervent prayer really is. Amen. Till next time, God bless you. Name of Jesus, we've got the power.